This is John Figliozzi of Clifton Park, New York. You're listening to the International Radio Report on CKUT 90.3 FM in Montreal. Welcome, everybody, to the International Radio Report for Sunday, September the 1st. Yes, September already. We thank you for tuning in here on CKUT 90.3 FM in Montreal. My name's Sheldon. I am here with Jill. We have 30 minutes of news and information from the world of radio for you, both from here in Montreal, across North America, and around the world. We thank you for uh, tuning in to us here, maybe for your first time. If you are, we welcome you, and to all our regular listeners. We have a lot of information, so we're going to get moving on it right away, starting with some uh, local information on a Montreal-based radio station that has activated its HD channels. Yeah, so um, it started off with a call that you got from Normand Martel, and you sent me a little email saying, apparently the HD channels are activated on 99.5, which was the... Old Weekend Radio, which was a music radio station, transformed into a talk radio format or 50% of the time so that they can keep their license. And so, yeah, they actually activated the HD channels. Uh, the HD channels are not activated on a lot of stations in Montreal. I went and listened to it. So I listened to the 99.5, the ID and the display gives their call sign, which is uh, is a CJPX. And, um, of course, um, standard talk radio. But with, with a twist, it's more of a talk radio that's partly an opinion, a personal opinion, more than a real research journalism, that I would say. Uh, there was actually, in, in La Presse, also a uh, little uh, article where they are saying that the first morning of Mario Dumont sounded very natural, like he's done that for a long time, so... Apparently, it's going well for um, the station like that with the format. Now, on HD2, this is what's interesting. It's actually weekend radio from Quebec City streamed on HD2. So when you go to HD2, it doesn't ID as anything special. So I had to listen for a while to really know who they were. And, yep, it's weekend 91.9 FM in Quebec City. They have Quebec City ads, even La Nodia. What is very interesting, they also kind of adopted, it seems, a talk format in the daytime. But I was so surprised to hear the identification at the top of the hour. They said in French, this is WKND 91.9 Quebec City. Well, that's not a legal call sign. No, not even the right uh, prefix for a Canadian radio station. So it seems like that's what they're using. I heard it twice. A lot of people were talking about this. There was a guy that came through Montreal that's on my shortwave channel and says, what's that WKND thing that I see on my display in my car? Isn't that a U.S. call? And I said, yeah, technically a W call is a U.S. station. There's not a call it's kind of a branding trying to call themselves weekend but that's what they put out and apparently that's what the id so this is hmm. i don't know how long it's going to last before who knows if somebody complains about it what people may not know too is that these hd channels are active because according to norma while he was listening uh they did not mention whatsoever that they had hd channels so, A, we don't know how many people out there have HD radios. We, I was talking to Norma on the phone, and we figure the majority of people who do would probably be people with fairly new cars yeah. that might have an HD radio in them. Now, do they know what to do with the HD radio in the car? That we don't know either. So, if the station doesn't decide to tell people that we have HD channels now and doesn't mention, well, this is what they are and how you get to them. You kind of wonder who's going to find them. And, uh, you know, is, is anybody going to be listening to them? It's the same all of, uh, across the band. I mean, if you listen to, um, you know, CGAD 800, listen to them for a couple of hours, they never mention that they have an HD outlet. Their HD outlet is on FM, which, once again, is all the weird stuff of HD. Not only are you on HD, but you have to explain to them that, no, we're not on 800 kilohertz HD. We're on 107.3. It's, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think for the majority of people that are not kind of radio geeks like us, it's all over their heads. It's, it's just too much. 
I think there's only one station in Montreal that does regularly mention their HD, and that's uh, TSN Radio, the sports station. Uh, I've heard them mentioning that you can get them on HD radio, so uh, a little bit of an exception there. But yeah. uh, if you don't tell people about it, there's no way they're going to know, and I really wonder how many people are going to bother. Well, the big story of uh, last week, which we talked about, was the shutdown and closure of uh, WCBS uh, News Radio in New York, and that happened on Sunday night, uh, last Sunday night into Monday morning. And uh, many of us, you had a, a live uh, YouTube uh, show going. Uh, we had a CIDX Zoom meeting going, and I'm sure there were other groups all over the place listening to the final uh, part of, uh, of WCBS wrapping up and the new station WHSQ 880 starting with an ESPN sports format. Uh, you were listening and recorded some of it, so we're going to insert uh, into the show here today just a little uh, wrap-up. Uh, the sign-off, the moment of silence, and then the first ID, and maybe the only I official ID you may ever hear on the ESPN channel uh, with their new call letters. So uh, we'll let you take a listen to that and come back and uh, comment on uh, uh, what we heard a little bit. My parents split when I was 11. We split Christmas, and when I was at Dad's house, he gave me a clock. And this one had a beam at the top that shined the time onto the ceiling. I wanted to make sure it was set correctly, so I went to the station I heard in the back of the car, WCBS, to make sure the time was exactly right. And I listened and listened, and before long, I became hooked as a 12, 13-year-old. When I was 14, my dad drove me to the radio station in New York City during morning rush hour traffic. And he introduced me to the place I'm now signing off in 2024. And for the final time, this is WCBS, New York. It's um, It was kind of emotional um, seeing, you know, that they had a uh, part of all the jingles and IDs over the years, uh, how it changed, and, um, you know, even going through that final identification of WCBS, that minute of silence, which was kind of nice. So yeah, moment in history. I hope you had a chance to listen to it. And uh, Jill, you're going to put something up on our CIDX YouTube channel yeah. as well, a little uh, longer clip of uh, of the final uh, minutes and uh, of uh, WCBS. So uh, you can check that out as well. Um, we have our next story coming from CBC News uh, via Radio World by Alessio Donini. Um, I think we're going to have more stories like this. The headline, would you listen to an AI radio announcer? Some in the region of the city of Woodstock, Ontario, have been doing so for months. The use of an AI announcer on a radio station in Woodstock, Ontario, has been met with mixed reactions from listeners, according to the owner of the station. But he says it isn't going anywhere. Over the past year, listeners who have tuned into 104.7 Heart FM during the late hours may have noticed an artificial voice reading weather forecasts, introducing songs, and presenting short news stories. According to Chris Burns, the owner of Burns Communications Incorporated, which operates Heart FM, it's by design that the announcer's artificial nature is apparent from the moment it begins speaking. We've been very upfront. We're not trying to hide or do anything like that, said Burns, a broadcaster with decades of experience, who also operates 105.1 The River in Niagara Falls and 101.1 More FM in Fort Erie. 104.7 Heart FM with AI Clio, the AI host said in the early morning hours of Sunday, August the 18th, before reading a news story about an Olympic medal dispute involving Romanian gymnast Anna Barbosu and U.S. gymnast Jordan Childs. The AI's delivery, packaged in a monotone and clearly computer-generated voice, meandered through the story for roughly 30 seconds, struggling at times with pronunciation, before introducing another song and fading out. We've heard from both sides of the aisle, so to speak. There are some people who will reach out to us saying, why are you replacing Canadian announcers with an artificial voice, Burns said. He also said other listeners have contacted the station to express interest and share positive feedback. 
Whatever the reaction, though, Burns said it's not about replacement, but rather supplementing what's already there using the technology that's available. No announcers have been replaced, and the number of people employed in those roles at his company hasn't changed. My commitment to my staff was that we didn't implement this because we thought we would be able to get rid of staff. Our idea was to actually provide a better product in those overnights adding that there's a sizable audience during the overnight hours who now benefit from weather updates and more general information where they didn't exist prior. He also said that weather updates and news stories that are read by AI announcers on his stations are handwritten by news staff to avoid the inaccuracies that AI-based platforms have in some cases become known for. Other radio companies in Canada, like Rogers Media, are experimenting with AI on the air as well. The trend also extends to other countries across the world. There are concerns from media unions, though. The president of the union that represents thousands of Canadian journalists and broadcasters say while the level of transparency Burns' stations employ is an important step, concerns remain. There are still lots of conversations to be had before we start making use of te this technology in a wider way, said Anik Forrest, the president of the Canadian Media Guild, which represents roughly 6,000 workers at outlets like CBC, TVO and the Canadian Press. She said in a, a particular concern of hers comes from the currency of stories AI announcers read, which may be written by a human, but outdated by the time they go to air. Forrest also expressed concerns for workers at radio stations and media companies without union representation. We, the unions, are not there to block techno technological advances. We just want to make sure that they're used appropriately and that workers are protected. She also added that AI is an important and recurring topic of discussion between unions and companies across the media landscape, particularly when it comes to job security and the replacement of human workers. As for Burns and his radio stations, the broadcaster says his company will continue to explore AI as a tool to enrich its stations, as will other broadcasters he's spoken to. The one thing I don't think will change is the local announcers who live in Woodstock, who are on the air at Heart FM. They live, they shop, they play, and they're involved in the community. They bring that content and put it on the air. It's why that radio station has 130,000 listeners a week tuning into it, because it is so focused on what's important to Oxford County. At least they're being transparent. They're telling people that that's what it is and why they're doing it. Um, I think it may be going on in some other places, though, where they're not trying to make it transparent and make it obvious. And they are using it in some places to cut back on staff, cut back on some expenses. So I, I can understand why the union is probably quite concerned about this. I think we're going to have to come to a point where um, when you put a radio station on the air, the FCC, the CRTC, and all the people that regulate radio will have to step up and say, okay, here's new guidelines. What percentage of time in a day can you use an AI rather than a real person so that there will be at least some people left on the radio? Because if you look at the fact that it's going to become so good at some point that it will completely replace humans. And this means, well, why pay for staff when a machine does it all? So it is scary for all of these people in the radio department everywhere. Powerful enough to react rapidly to a situation, to a local news item, or if you have to do interaction with real humans, it's still a tough one for computers. So that, that uh, means real people will need to be there for a while. But let's face it. Even that's going to become so good at some point. This is kind of taking it an extra step from what we've had for quite a long time. There are many stations that do a lot of voice tracking. That still takes people to go in and record maybe like four hours of radio in 45 minutes or something. So, you know, there's not somebody live there the whole time, but at least it's a real voice that did the recording that's put out on the air. This is taking it that extra step where somebody has created the content, uh, which 
you know, doesn't take very long probably, and then it's just handed into the AI system. So yeah, it's it's going to be something to monitor, and uh, I think it's going to be a quickly developing story over the over the next uh, weeks and months, and and you know as we move forward. Yeah, most mostly years. I think it's going to take a few years still to get to the level that we need that is going to be undetectable. But mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely going to be there at one point. So we have an uh, updated story of the American Radio Relay League uh, that confirms $1 million ransom payment. Uh, this is by Sergio Gatlan, bleeping computer. The American Radio Relay League confirmed it paid $1 million ransom to obtain a decryptor to restore systems encrypted in a May ransomware attack. After discovering the incident, the National Association for Amateur Radio took impacted systems offline to contain the breach. One month later, it said its network was hacked by a malicious international cyber group in a sophisticated network attack. ARRL later alerted impacted individuals via data breach notifications letters that it detected a sophisticated ransomware incident on May 14th after its computer systems were encrypted. In a July filing with the Office of Maine's Attorney General, ARRL said the resulting data breach affected only 150 employees. While the organization has not yet linked the attack to a specific ransomware operation, sources told Bleeping Computer that the embargo ransomware gang was beyond the breach. ARRL also said the breach notifications that they've already taken all reasonable steps to prevent data from being further published or distributed, which was interpreted at the time as a veiled confirmation that a ransom was or will likely be paid. One million dollar ransom covered by insurance, uh, it seems. On Wednesday, ARRL revealed that it had indeed paid the attackers a ransom not to prevent stolen data from being leaked online, but to obtain a decryption tool to restore systems impacted during the attack on the morning of May 15th. The ransom demands by the the attackers uh, in exchange for ex access to their decryption tool were exorbitant. It was clear they didn't know and didn't care that they had attacked a small 501c3 organization with limited resources, it said in a statement published yesterday. Their ransom demands were dramatically weakened by the fact that they did not have access to any compromising data. It was also clear that they believed ARL had extensive insurance coverage that would cover a multi-million dollar ransom payment. After days of tense negotiations and brinkmanship, ARL agreed to pay a one million ransom. That payment, along with the cost of restoration, has been largely covered by our insurance policy. ARL says that most systems have already been restored and anticipates that it will take up to two months to bring back all affected servers, mostly minor servers for internal, internal use, under new infrastructure guidelines and new standards. So, well, the first big blunder I would say to the URL that is there is that if you had to pay a million dollar ransom, you didn't back up anything. And in computers, especially when you have a business of any kind, a backup is the first thing that you need to have that prevents you from hey paying bad guys when things happen um i was a little shocked that they had that kind of money to pay a ransom too but it seems that the uh, the, uh, the the hackers wanted a lot more so that kind of went down but uh, still crazy that they had to pay a million dollars to get their stuff back it uh, does say that you know, it was mostly covered by their insurance, but uh, I can just imagine what that's going to do to their insurance premiums yeah. <laughs> down the road yeah. that the insurance company was having to cover the cost of them basically, you know, not doing what they should have done uh, to prevent this from happening in the first place. So a lesson learned, I hope, for the American Radio Relay League. Yeah, I'm pretty sure the new systems are going to be a lot better. <laughs> What's happening with our son? Uh, well, our son, of course, still very active. Uh, there's been quite a few flares this week once again. There's still a couple of sunspots, AR-3799, AR-3800, that have uh, what it takes for strong 
M-class solar flares. There's, of course, uh, some auroras that showed up during the week in different parts when we uh, reached um, some G2-class geomagnetic storm that um, arrived around August the 28th. So um, this might still be the case in the week ahead if uh, more of the uh, solar flares um, do give out some coronal mass ejections. And uh, solar flux is 204, sunspot number 124. Um, so conditions this week will continue to be up and down depending on the sunspots flaring or not. But in between all of that, very high solar activity and very good propagation everywhere. It's really interest interesting to listen to the bands uh, and tune around, uh, especially now, uh, getting into September. It's very, very interesting uh, on the higher frequencies, what we hear. But you know what? If you want to witness all of this, well, you got to have and turn on the radio and listen. This is Amanda Dawn Christie telling you that if you're interested in radio, AM, FM, shortwave, amateur radio, pirate broadcasting, and more, you won't want to miss the International Radio Report every Sunday morning at 10.30 on CKUT, 90.3 FM in Montreal, and online at ckut.ca. Our next story is uh, from a Voice of America press release uh, forwarded by Fred Waterer. Uh, Voice of America launches Fulani language programming. August 26th, the Voice of America began broadcasting to the Fulani-speaking audience in Africa. With an estimated population of more than 40 million across West and Central Africa, the Fula people are considered to be the world's largest nomadic group. The inaugural Fulani language program, Fula Voices, is a 30-minute radio show with a significant digital presence specifically designed for Fulani youth. The program links traditional Fulani culture with the modern world and focuses on empowering and inspiring the younger generation. The show will cover a diverse range of topics through segments carefully curated to captivate a young audience while preserving their cultural heritage. With unbiased news and information in the Fulani language, we hope to play a part in the daily life of the Fulani people, said VOA Africa Division Director Sawa Jafari. Part of the VOA French to Africa language service, VOA Fulani joins the organization's network of 48 other broadcast languages, including 16 in the VOA Africa division. Uh, Fred Waterer adds, the release implies over-the-air broadcasting, kind of. Of course, no times or frequencies were offered, but I've been digging around the VOA website, but found nothing so far. So um, not a lot of publicity, I guess, or information available about the service, yeah. just the fact that they have started the service. It's pretty cool. It's nice to see that they're uh, trying to cater to different audiences um, in Africa. It's, uh, I think, always a good thing. And younger audiences, too, which yeah. is really good. Uh, next story, Pyongyang objects to the installation of radio stations on the border. Uh, this is Nova News via Radio Info Asia. North Korea, in a rare display of dissent to its historic ally China, has objected to Beijing's plans to install telecommunication systems and infrastructure near the border between the two countries. North Korea expressed its dissent publicly via an official email sent to the international frequency management organizations. In an email obtained by the Kyodo News Agency, the North Korean authorities complain about China's lack of prior consultations. Last June, the Geneva-based organization communicated with the available terrestrial transmission networks to the various countries. China plans to install 191 stations on its territory for terrestrial broadcasts of various types, including FM radio broadcasts. Of course, in a very closed country that doesn't want outside news to get in, it's not very interesting for them to have all of these transmitters next to the border, which means a nice big chunk of North Korea will be in Chinese programming, of, and uh, that might not always be what they want to hear. Yeah, they want to limit uh, what people can hear in North Korea, and um, 
if some of those uh, stations carry foreign language broadcasting on those transmitters, uh, then they're going to easily get into North Korea. So uh, interesting, a uh, uh, little bit of uh, sort of communications war going on between the two countries. Yeah, it is definitely, inter definitely interesting also the fact that it's, you know, North Korea and China that are battling here. It's like, huh, interesting. They don't agree always on the same things, it seems. Yeah. So we have upcoming ham radio contests. Quite a bit going on uh, coming up, uh, actually a little bit today and then some more uh, later uh, next weekend. Uh, first off, the Tennessee CUSO party, 1700 uh, September 1st to 0300 September the 2nd. That's organized by the Tennessee Contest Group. It's um, all band except for the work bands and the modes uh, phone, SSB, FM, CW, and digital. There's the Michigan QRP Club that has the um, QRP Labor Day CW Sprint. 2300 Zulu, September 2nd to 03 Zulu, September 3rd. Bands 160 through 6 meters, and it's CW. The Japan Amateur Radio League has the All Asian DX Contest, the phone portion. 0 hundred September 7th to 2359 September the 8th. It's 160 through 10 meters, no work bands. It is an SSB contest. There's the Deutsche Amateur Radio Club that has the, a, the IARU Region 1 Field Day, SSB, 1300 Zulu September 7th to 1259 Zulu September 8th. This is 160 through 10 meters, SSB and CW. The German Telegraphy Activity Group has the uh, Straight Key Party, 1600 to 1900 Zulu, September the 7th, 40 meter band only, and it is only CW. There's the Penn Ohio DX Society that has the uh, PODXS 070 Club J UDEC Memorial 80 meter sprint, 2000 Zulu, September 7th to 2000 Zulu, September 8th. It's dedicated to the memory of J. Udak, KA3X. The band is 80 meters, and it's PSK31 only. Organized by the CW Ops is their CW Ops CW Open, 2000 to 2359 Zulu, September 7th, 160 through 10 meters, and CW only for that one. The National Contest Journal has the North American Sprint CW from 0 hour Zulu to 0 4 hour Zulu, September 8th. Bands are 80, 40, and 20 meters only, and it's CW. Busy, busy weekend for ham radio activities, so uh, have fun with that, both as a ham operator or uh, simply just uh, tuning across the bands and listening into some of them. That is going to wrap it up uh, for us here today. A lot of information passed along. If you'd like to reach us at all, radio report at yahoo.com is our email address. You can listen to our show live streaming and archived at ckut.ca. Our Facebook group, we welcome uh, Illich and Vince to our uh, growing group of members. We have 957 members. We invite you to join the Facebook group. Our YouTube channel, uh, find it on youtube.com slash at IRR. Uh, you can uh, tune into all of our programs on their past and present. And our X account at IRRCKUT. We invite you to follow us there. We hope you'll tune in again next week. You've been listening to us here on the International Radio Report on CKUT 90.3 FM in Montreal. Have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye. CBS Network Alert. 1970, The Chopper. Headline Stories. WCBS Bulletin. WCBS Special. News 88 Business. News 88 Update.
Ah, here's everyone's favorite. We never should have stopped playing these. We should have kept paying Steve Carmen as much as he wanted. Everyone